Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Seek and Destroy. And today we're going to talk about the Joker movie. And I have plenty of spoilers coming up. So if you don't want any spoilers, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I would say turn away right now because we're going to dive right in and have a full discussion of this film. Can I say anything about this film that someone else hasn't said already? Probably not. Um, I, you know, there are people out there that really love this film. They think it's a masterpiece. They think it's the best thing ever. Uh, and then there's obviously the other extreme where people are saying, like, if you go see it, you're some kind of incel or whatever. I mean, I know all of that stuff. I'm fully aware of it. I don't make videos on that stuff. I'll talk about it maybe in the discussion videos uh, because it's part of, you know, the, the the environment and the tapestry of the film and like the marketing and then what and how people react. So obviously we'll talk about it on stuff like this, but I don't typically like to get into what people say because I really don't care what other people say, whether they loved it or hated it um, or if they're in the middle, whatever. It's cool to hear sometimes people's opinions, especially people I'm friends with and stuff, get their opinions because I respect their opinions. Um, but ultimately, I'm going to make up my own mind and I wish more and more of us were like that too. Not saying I'm some kind of awesome person for doing that. Um, I know a lot of people out there do make up their own mind, uh, but a lot of people do, they still make up their own mind, but they engage with this horrible behavior online. And they, they say like, hey, look at this stupid doctor in Australia who, you know, how did she get a degree? Because, you know, she thinks this of, of Joker or whatever. It's like, look, yeah, I don't agree with what she says about Joker, but who cares? Why are you retweeting her words? You know, it's just going to drive more toxicity, more negativity. Um, you calling her dumb and, and say, you know, and saying like, how did you get your degree? You're just proving her point. You know, like she's trying to make a point that doesn't make sense, but yet you're feeding that point. And so now she can look at your tweets and go, see, this is how men react. This is how, you know, boys react. This is how we have a problem in this world. And it's like, you just don't feed it. You don't feed into it. You don't agree. Fine. You don't agree. I'm not saying like shut your mouth and keep your opinions to yourself. Voice your opinions. But when you share someone else's with yours, you're just you're just doing exactly what they want. These articles that come out and say like, oh, Joker is this, Joker is that. It's like it's so funny that the, the type of culture we live in, um, because I'm pretty sure a lot of people that tweet negative stuff about Joker or post or write articles about him here in America may not actually feel that way. Some do, for sure, because nowadays we don't really have journalists anymore. We just have activists, people who feel everything, and they and they, they, they just talk about how they feel. But our feelings can be wrong. I've been young. I've been passionate about stuff. And even just a couple years ago, I would tweet or post passionate things, and uh, and people would call me out on it. And I go, you know what? I am... I am reacting uh, just emotionally, and that's okay sometimes, but the way you do it, it can be very self-destructive, but obviously it gets clicks, and sometimes these people in higher positions, they, they they use that. They're like, oh, I see this person being passionate. Let's put this, you know, what they said on my website, and it'll get clicks, because people will agree and disagree with it, and then they'll be fighting, and they'll be commenting, and they'll be yelling, and they'll be sharing it, and they'll be going, look how stupid this person is, or and how, look at how stupid their article is, or look how brilliant this person is, and how their article is. I totally agree, and that's all they want. That's what these companies want. That's how they make their money, and that's how, and that's why articles like you know the ones you hate keep coming out. So don't feed it, man. Uh, it's a it's a beast. It's a demon, and if you feed the demon. It gets more powerful, gets stronger, it spreads more, um, and it spreads its stupidity and evil everywhere. So to me, I'm like, I don't like to make videos, you know, purely on people and how they act like that because it's it's disgusting. And the reason I bring that up is because it's part of our society, and society is definitely a theme of the Joker film. Uh, that's really something. When I was watching this, I was like, you know. It, this is really constructed in a very unique way. I'm, yeah, everyone's going to say, oh, dude, reference Taxi Driver and re reference King of Comedy and stuff. It's like, yes, those are fantastic films. And yes, those are inspirations for this film, along with a bunch of other movies, I'm sure, that Todd Phillips has watched and liked over the years. Um, and, I'm, and comic books were probably very little inspiration for this movie. I mean, I'm sure there was some you know, inspiration, but probably very little. And you can see that because most of the characters in the movie are made up. There's Joker. And there's Thomas and Martha Wayne and their son, Bruce. And I guess that guy was Alfred. Um, I don't think they call him Alfred, but I'm pretty sure it was. Although Alfred used to be a combat guy. But uh, like in the, in the uh, you know, Joel Schumacher or Tim Burton movies, he wasn't. He was just like an old guy. Uh, <laughs> too, too old to do, you know, physical combat. So when this guy gets like Joker, like strangles him for a minute there or whatever, I'm just like, wow, this Alfred doesn't, doesn't fight back, does he? Uh, even though he's a younger man. But it's like, yeah, not every version of Alfred has to be the same either. And that was kind of the point of this was... Um, was uh, this, you know, society. How does it let you down? Um, if you already are on the bottom, 
does it ever try to help you up? It says it tries to help you up. You know, there's Thomas Wayne coming in, uh, talking on the news shows, going, I want to be mayor. Um, I want to bring this town up. There's a lot of disenfranchised people here, and I want to help them up. At one point, though, he gets a little too extreme, calls them clowns, uh, you know, which we see that every day in, in our society, and it's and everyone acts like everything is new. They, ask, they act like, uh, you know, um, being outraged by stuff is brand new, and it's, it's not. Like, it's not. I learned the other day that one of the first school shootings was like an 1840 uh with like a musket type you know reloading gun um and it was like and I, I they were telling the story about how like i think two or three kids in the class were killed and i was like oh my god and then someone was like only only two or three that's not too bad you know like and i'm like yeah but back then there was probably only five kids in that classroom so that was like that wiped out half the class you know whatever so and, and every life is tragic when it's lost in that kind of way so when i when you actually look at history when you look at society nothing's new like you know this outrage culture about oh you know people who like joker are just men who hate women and all that stuff if you go back to friday the 13th and you watch that movie um and you watch the um re you know the reviews of that movie and people on talk shows back in the late 70s early 80s there were men coming up on shows going yeah this is just men who like hate women who were rejected their whole life and they made this movie that you know yeah, you know, kills young girls and stuff. But meanwhile, the killer of that movie is a woman and she's doing it out of uh, revenge for her son that died. So there's like a motivation there. Um, and then the survivor is a woman, you know, in that movie too. So it's it's just funny that these arguments have been around. It's, it's nothing new and everyone treats it like it is and they prop it up. Like, well, this is the first time people are getting so mad about these movies and stuff and, and, and putting these unfair, you know, the, the, these unfair you know, things attached to movies. It's like, no, that's been around forever. <laughs> as long as movies have been around, there have been that kind of thing uh, where, where, you know, reviewers or, or whatever journalists will put an unfair, they'll tether it to something because that'll sell papers. That'll get, you know, people to tune into your nightly TV show. That'll get, uh, you know, ratings that, you know, get whatever. It'll get clicks on your website. That's the only thing that changes is the device. But for the most part, it's all the same. Uh, so this cyclical cycle we're in, is something that's kind of reflected a little bit in the movie. What I love most about this movie, as we dive right into it now, because I've talked about all the build-up to it, um, that we dive in this movie, every scene has Arthur Fleck in it. Joaquin Phoenix plays Arthur Fleck, who eventually becomes the Joker in the film, as a lot of you know, and, uh, and we get to see his life. And now in this, we get stuff that the comic books never gave us. We don't know who Arthur, we didn't, you know, in the comics, he, you know, there was hints at Jack Napier. Obviously, that was the Tim Burton, you know, name that he was given um, when he became, he was Jack Napier and then became the Joker in the Tim Burton Batman movie in 18, uh, 1989. Um, but, uh, you know, he's never really had a real name. Uh, right now, I think Jeff Johns is going to explore that coming up in a book called Three Jokers, where he found out by sitting on Batman found out he sat on the Mobius chair, which I know it's going to I'm speaking Greek to some of you out there. But the Mobius chair is one of my favorite characters. Uh, it's attached to Metron, who's one of my favorite characters from the New Gods. And when you sit in that chair, you get, you know, infinite knowledge. He sits in the chair and he asks two questions. Who killed my parents? Boom. Joe Chill did. OK. And uh, and who and who is the Joker? And the question the, the, the chair goes, which Joker? And Batman says, what? And the chair goes, well, you've encountered three different beings that are all went by the name Joker. Uh, and that's like the big twist uh, in the comic book. So that over the 80 years that Batman has fought Joker, he's run into three different kinds of Jokers who all took the mantle. Um, so I find that interesting, but that's probably as close as we're ever going to get maybe to an origin for Joker. But this movie is straight up that. It's an origin. It's uh, But I would say that this script was probably written I'm going to guess maybe not even as a Joker movie, like just as a movie. And then they were like, oh, we can get the Joker property and we can rewrite a couple things and rework some things and really explore a character and do a character study. Uh, because I feel like I just when I was watching this, I feel like somebody watched Dark Knight and was like, Joker is so great in that movie. And Batman is kind of forgettable in Dark Knight. Like, I, I don't see a lot of people praise Christian Bale for his performance in that movie. Um, a lot of people talk about Heath Ledger, and I feel like someone watched that movie and said, I wonder what this movie would be like without Batman. And they did that. <laughs> and then that's what this movie is. And it works because there's still the same level of intensity with the character. It's just different. It's just a lot different. Um, when I see people review this movie negatively, uh, the stuff they say, it's always the same. It's a lot of people who are down on this movie aren't talking about the technical aspects of the movie, which I think are fantastic. I think the cinematography is really well done. The shots, the, the angles and stuff, um, the, the score was really good. And it's simple, 
effective. And I heard they made the score before they even filmed the movie. So there were some scenes where Joaquin Phoenix could actually hear the score because they wrote in the script, Todd Phillips, when he was describing Arthur Fleck, he said, Arthur has music in him. And that was one thing that there's like this, this, this dance inside Arthur. There's this energy that just causes him to just move around and, and feel the moment and be part of the moment and embrace it um, and dance. And that's like how he expresses himself um, in this like joyous way of like, oh, how like when things are kind of going his way, um, even if they're dark and disturbing, but if it's still going his way um, or he sees it as going his way, it's it's that energy coming out and, and manifesting itself in a dance. And so they wanted the music First, they want him to hear the music that he'll be dancing to. So they did the score, uh, you know, before they filmed the movie and they were able to play some of it during some of the scenes in the movie um, when they were completed so he could dance to them, you know, properly uh, so that it looked like he was dancing to the actual music that was playing. And I thought that was great. And there were some other songs, you know, in this movie too, some on the nose, you know, like they do that a lot with DC movies, like uh, Zack Snyder's really big on that with Watchmen and and stuff where he'll play a, a, a classic song, <laughs> you know, like The Sound of Silence in the most obvious way and you're just like okay cool like you're like whatever you couldn't have picked a different song that wasn't as on the nose you know but they they do and then suicide squad's another example where they just pick these songs that are just so on the nose that are just basically telling you the plot of the movie or the character in the song and you're just kind of like i don't need all that just tell me just tell me who the character is you let the movie do that not the music um so anyway, so in this one, they kind of made the two as one. It was, you know, the music was a way for Arthur to express himself and it caused him to dance. So I thought that was interesting that they did the score first. That's not often done in movies. Um, there's a lot of unconventional ways of storytelling in this that work. Like I said, Arthur Fleck, Joaquin Phoenix is in every scene in this movie. You only see the story through his point of view. And that's very important. It's very practical to do that for this because you have to know the difference between what's really happening to Arthur and what isn't. And you can only really know that through his eyes. Um, as the truth starts to get revealed to him later on, uh, you know, you start to see what is really happening to him, what he's really experiencing versus what he imagined in his mind. Uh, that was really cool. I love how they did that, that parallel of like, like, because right off the bat, they show you he does go into a dream world he he sees himself on uh you know the murray show and he's like oh and he's like in the audience talking to him but that never happened uh you know or did it i mean it did to arthur you know to arthur it was very real he he felt like he was in that moment and he felt like he made murray laugh and he felt a connection it's about fatherly figures right it's this it's this man who's looking for guidance looking for direction he uh, can't find it anywhere. He doesn't get it at his job. People think he's weird there. Um, you know, do you even hear stories like he's like, you know, his boss like, hey, some of the other guys told me you did this. And he's like, but I didn't. And we saw it from his perspective. He didn't do it. But did he? You know, like, we don't really know. You can't trust anything he's really telling you, but not in a way to where the movie feels like it didn't matter. Because there is that, you know, line where it's like a, that Dallas effect where it's like, oh, that whole season was a dream. If you've never seen Dallas, like, that's how I think the second season ends where they were just like, oh, it was all a dream. We'll, you know, we'll continue on next season or whatever without with new stuff. Um, and it, it like erased the whole thing. It wasn't like that. It didn't erase anything. Every, they, you can, at least I could tell everything that Arthur went through with his mother um, I don't think he fabricated that. You know, he fabricated the Murray stuff. He fabricated the stuff with Zazie Beats, where he like felt a connection with her. Um, she probably really did in the in the you know elevator do the thing to him when she was like you know trying to saying how like the elevator was breaking and how crappy the city they live in and how crappy the building they live in is and all that stuff and they're kind of setting that connection between them. Um, but Arthur reads way more into it. You know, obviously she just sees it as a friendly, like, oh my God, yeah, kill me, right? Like this place sucks. Um, but he interprets that as a connecting moment because that was the day he was given a gun by someone at work. Although his boss heard that he, you know, solicited the guy. He went up to uh, the, 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 the big guy at work, the other clown, and said, give me your, like, give me your gun, I'll buy it off you. But according to our version that we saw with Arthur, the guy gave it to him as a, a gift of some kind and he said oh you just owe me one you know just owe me one next time and uh, and that's how he ends up with the gun in the hospital with the kids that was a terrifying scene when he's like dancing and he stomps his feet he's like uh if you're happy you know it stomp your feet and he stomps his feet and the gun comes out in front of a room full of kids i'm like oh my god and then he gets fired for that obviously it's like this movie i'm all over the place because that's what this movie did to me it unraveled me i think people who are positive about this movie really felt challenged by it. I'm not going to say we're all the same. 
you know, uh, I'm not going to say everyone who hates this movie is the same type of person, although I've read a lot of their reviews um, now that I've seen the movie, and I've read a lot of their comments on social media, and I've seen the same regurgitated stuff come out of their mouth. And I also see people who overly praise it do the same thing. But I would say more people like me who are kind of just like try to be objective about stuff and can balance and play devil's advocate with themselves. Um, they'll, they'll look at this movie objectively and go, here's why I liked it. It challenged me. And I noticed a lot of people who really liked this movie, it did challenge them. Um, this movie really challenged me. Uh, it, it made me cry, actually, at one point. It was very emotional. I hurt inside every time I was watching Arthur do simple things. The scene where he's like tying the laces and he's super skinny, obviously lost a lot of weight for this movie. Uh, he looked terrifying. Uh, when he's dancing around his underwear, it was off-putting. But you just, it's hard to watch this movie, to, to, to see this guy be happy. He's almost naked and he's in his room and he's like, you know, waving a gun around and he's dancing and he's caught up in the moment. The gun goes off. I mean, it's so hard to watch someone unstable. If you've never been around someone unstable, consider yourself very lucky. Um, you know, as people get older, like he's taking care of his mother, she's losing her facility. She's, you know, breaking down mentally on a lot of levels. She's writing Thomas Wayne letters. She confesses that, you know, in one of the letters, like, hey, you know, why don't you write me back? And that's what the whole story with her is. is she's waiting for Thomas Wayne to write her back because she used to work for him at his manor years ago. And, uh, and so he's like, you know, like 20, 30 years ago, whatever. And so she's like, I, I'm looking for him to reach out to me. I, I used to be, uh, I would work for him. And then he, of course, Thomas Wayne's on TV going, anyone who's ever worked for me is like family and I'll take care of you. And so she takes that as a, like a, any person unbalanced would, they see something on TV and they'll go, oh, he's, he's talking to us, Arthur. And so she writes another letter to Thomas Wayne saying, hey, I've been taking care of your son, Arthur. And Arthur sees this letter and starts to believe that Thomas Wayne is his biological father. And he never knew who his father was. He grew up without one. Um, he has a lot of repressed memories from him when he's a kid. He's talking to this woman, at, you know, a psychiatrist. She's like a social worker. And uh, he's talking to her and she's asking him the same question. He, he says it. You see it in the trailer. He says, you know, why do you just, you ask me the same questions. You ask me how my day's going. If I have any negative thoughts, all I have are negative thoughts. He's breaking down at this point after his second visit to her um, in like a week span of time or whatever, because he's not getting help. And they just keep pumping him full of medicine. And I don't know if many of you know about this in the 80s and stuff about Reagan and like the, the, the you know, funding being canceled for mental health institutions and a lot of mental health facilities just being like, you know, take, you know, told to close down. And a lot of those patients just wandered, you know, some were sent to other facilities, some of the ones that were really bad off, uh, but some were just wandered out in the streets. A lot of them became the homeless, you know, in those areas where those facilities shut down. And it was it was a big deal. And so when I was watching this, I kept thinking about that and those those moments um, about when those those facilities were shut down and stuff. And I was like, man, this is hard seeing this guy go to someone for help um, and not get it. And the lady just she's just doing her job, but she doesn't really care. She's not invested enough uh, to like, you know, really care about Arthur. And he he and he rubs her the wrong way, he scares her. Like she looks at his journal. He's got like pornographic images like cut out. There's like, if you notice, if you look really closely, it's like a naked woman's body, her head's, you know, the, the, it's like an image of her, like, obviously the head was there at one point, that was like from a magazine, but he cut the head off and put it in there and like wrote weird stuff all around it. And he says it's a book full of jokes, but as she's flipping through, it's like, it's not like, it's really dark. If it's jokes, it's like a gallows sense of humor, even worse than gallows humor. It's really, really dark. So, um, it's, it's tough. Like, I mean, it, it was it was hard watching this character in this movie, and I think that's the point. This movie is supposed to challenge you. You're not really supposed to root for Arthur in any way, except I felt when I'm watching this movie, I kept rooting for him to stop. He kept having these little moments where you can stop here. You can stop before it gets worse, and he doesn't. And you, and it, and you, it breaks your heart in a sense that you want to believe every human being's good on the inside. You just want to. Batman wants to believe that. That's where he starts off in his mission. He starts off a little grim. You know, I know a lot of people don't like Batman with hope or anything, but he had to start off with a, as, with a hopeful message at one point. Hey, I'm going to stop crime and, you know, and, and, and I can change people. The cartoon did it really well where he's like talking to Matt Hagen, the Clayface, and he's like, I can rehabilitate you. Mr. Freeze, I can help Nora Freeze. I like that side of Batman, someone who's willing to to try to cure his villains so he doesn't spend the rest of his life fighting them, right? That's the whole point. And, uh, and so, uh, so I like that in this, 
Joker, you know, you see him crumble and you are Batman in a way you, like, at least I felt that way. I was like, stop, stop right now, Arthur, don't do this. And then he does it. And you're like, Oh God, no, 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 no. Okay. Okay. And you, and you start breaking down and there's a, there's a challenge there because they reveal things about him. Um, life was not easy on him. And I know people are going to go screw, you know, I, I've seen people do it. They're like, who cares about this, this, you know, white guy who's crazy, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that's the root of the problem, though, is that we don't care. You want to have these political conversations? Fine. But get to the root of them. Start caring about these people that are broken and try to pull them back. Nobody tried to pull Arthur back. Everybody kept pushing, pushing him over and over. The guy at work who you know, gave him the gun kept pushing him, um, you know, and, and he is according to Arthur telling lies about him. Uh, the social worker says, hey, you can't come see me anymore. They cut off her funding. They don't care about you. They don't care about me. And he's like, what about my medicine? You don't get medicine anymore. So the six different pills he was on that was repressing the darkness inside of him that was ready to come out, the thing that laughed when people were being hurt, the thing that made him feel, you know, like he was feeling bad when, you know, he would laugh at stuff. But really, that was the real him. They reveal these truths to him, like, you know, the cops are after him. There's all these things. He, you know, he kills those three guys on the subway train. He sees them as terrorizing this girl. Maybe that really did happen, um, but maybe it didn't. Maybe the, you know, who knows? I saw someone online had a theory that that girl in the subway, that the three uh, Wayne Enterprise, you know, jock, you know, Wall Street dudes were like hitting on and like flirting with. And they were like really pressing, like they were getting really creepy around her. Arthur starts laughing because when he's nervous, he laughs. It's an involuntary thing. He has a condition, he says. Um, but when he laughs, the performance is so dang good because you can see pain. He's laughing, sure, so he makes the sound of laughter. But then he instantly, like, a, 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 to me, immediately turns to tragedy. Comedy, tragedy, back and forth. Just like the opening scene where he's pulling his face up and doing this. It's He's trying, to, like, there's a part of him that is dark, that wants to get out. And then there's the the pills that, you know, put the shell around it. And that side has been around so long now. He suppressed the evil so long. He's trying to do good things, trying to cheer up the kid on the bus. He's trying to make a connection with people, trying to make people laugh, trying to be a comedian. And everyone wants to just make fun of him. Everyone wants to keep pushing him down. And, it, you know, take out the fact that he's just a white guy or whatever. Put anyone in those shoes, anyone who's ever felt like that, um, especially broken people, people like, and people will say this movie's going to make, you know, someone go out and kill somebody. Let me tell you something. Someone who wants to go out and kill somebody will do it no matter what they will find inspiration through anything. I think was it, um, there was, you know, killers that have talked to their dogs. My dog told me to do it. Um, you know, my lampshade told me to do it. I saw, I heard a news broadcast. It told me to do it. Um, yeah. Okay. I saw a movie. It told me to do it. I heard a song. It told me to do it. Those people who are that far gone, they will find an excuse from anywhere because they want one so bad. Um, and Arthur, the side of him that's looking for an excuse is battling this side that is repressing it with with pills. So when he is off his meds, he really breaks down rapidly. And the real world is starting to show he's not really dating or, or sleeping with Zazzy Beats. You know, that's just something he made up in his head. He imagined her being there when his mom was in the hospital. Uh, nope, we don't even know how his mom got in the hospital. For all we know, Arthur did something to her. The police say, oh, we questioned her and it upset her when we questioned her. That could be true, sure. But the movie tells it in a way where it's like, yeah, that, that's plausible. Most likely that's what happened. But as we learn throughout the rest of the story, where Arthur kind of the lines are blurred between them. We don't know. He was, before the cops came and questioned his mom, Arthur was arguing with her through the door. And then he was like, I'm calm, mom. Just tell me what the truth is. Is Thomas Wayne my father? And she says, yes, he is. So he goes and confronts Thomas Wayne. And meanwhile, the cops apparently go talk to his mom. And then, you know, next thing you know, she's in the hospital. So you never really know. The scene where he goes and talks to Bruce Wayne, thinking Bruce Wayne's his little brother, that was heart like it, it was it hurt because you can see him he's like oh i'm trying to cheer up my little brother i have a connection i'm not alone anymore um this is great i have like a half brother so he like pulls on you know uh bruce wayne's face and lifts it up makes a smile and it's so creepy and you're just and in us knowing who bruce wayne's gonna be makes that scene even more intense because we're like wow this guy is you're gonna be great enemies one day like you two are the opposites and one day you're gonna fight over and over and over with the fate of Gotham hanging in the balance between the two of you. It's, it's, in, it's intense. It's like knowing the, the, the outcome 
makes that scene more intense, even though it already is a really well done scene, an intense scene. Um, but yeah, it was creepy. He's like grabbing a little kid's face. And of course, you know, Alfred run, you know, shoes him off or whatever. And uh, then he runs into Thomas Wayne later. And Thomas Wayne's like, look, I'm not your dad. And he tells him the truth. He goes, your mom was, uh, we, we found out she was working for us. We found out she was like, you know, had delusions and she, she was a, 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 she had mental issues. And so she was brought to, you know, Arkham State Hospital. And, uh, and he, you know, Arthur's like, no, she wasn't. He goes, yeah. And she goes, she adopted you, man. Like you, you were adopted while she was working with us. And then she started coming up with all these weird things and saying all these weird things. And so we had her committed and, uh, and we found out stuff that she was doing to you. And we found, you know, and he was like, what? And so he doesn't believe it. Thomas Wayne knocks him out. And then, you know, joke, you know, Joker, I guess uh, Arthur Fleck, now that he's no longer on meds, he's transforming. Um, he goes and talks to, uh, you know, someone at Arkham State and the guy at Arkham State pulls out the file and he doesn't want to read it. He's like, he sees this, the part about the sun and he's like, I can't read it. And Arthur's like, give it to me. And he reaches in, grabs it, runs down the stairwell. And when he's reading it, that's the scene that broke me. Um, like I said, the performance Arthur gives when he laughs is so intense. Um, I can't imagine an actor going to the place that Joaquin did in this movie and coming out of it okay. I mean, that this is this is really an intense role. He really committed to it. He lost weight for it. He put himself through this pain. He's laughing. It's painful. He's but he's like at the end, he's crying comedy tragedy. But then you can hear him like hawking up bile and phlegm after the laugh because it burns. It's like it's this you can see it in him. It's burning to like this side of him to get out. And he's thinking it's a disorder. Here it's the real him. It's that's the, the part of him that was hurt when he was a child that's been sitting inside buried under all these pills for all these years so he could try to adapt to a society that's never going to accept him and that's the, ultimately the revelation he reveals at the end is that he's like i'm going to go on the murray show and my revenge to murray for bringing me on and making fun of me is i'm going to kill myself and that's going to make murray look bad and it's going to probably shut the show down and you know and whatever and but it'll end my life and that's my plan and he has this plan throughout the whole movie is He's going to go on the Murray show with talk to Robert De Niro, who did a great job, by the way. Um, everyone who's in this, all the little parts too, uh, Mark Maron and everyone have little parts, as he beats. They play very small roles, but they're all very essential and important. The mother, the girl who played the mother, Conley, I can't remember her last her first name or if that's her last name or not, but she was fantastic. I mean, and Thomas Wayne, only a couple scenes. I think he was in a Dark Knight movie before, um, which is kind of funny, but still... Everyone in this, I thought, did a really good job, but mostly it's Joaquin. And I saw people saying, oh, this is an ego vanity project. You know, he has to have every line, every scene. It's like, no, but that's the story. You need that. You need to be on this ride with Arthur the whole time. You can't deviate. You can't see something from someone else's perspective too much because it gives it away. It gives away the truth at the end where Arthur finds out that when he goes to Arkham and he gets that paper, he looks at it and he says, you know, he reads it out loud and he says, if he finds out that his mother did adopt him and then she used to date a guy and she would let that guy tie Arthur to a radiator and sexually abuse him. When I was, when this scene was being, you know, when this happened in the movie, my roommate was right next to me. He immediately turned and looked at me because he knew, he knew what this scene meant to me. And uh, I broke down, man. I, I, <laughs> really broke down um this is where the movie challenged me most because a lot of people out there have gone through horrible things as kids a lot of people i'm gonna say even you know we all have our demons we've all been through our stuff we've all had stuff happen to us but someone out there always has it worse hearing this story broke me and it challenged me because all i could think of i mean if you guys knew the kind of stuff I struggle with, I, can you imagine? Can you imagine a life where you go through something like that as a kid? You have an abusive father. You have other things that happen to you that are reminiscent of stuff that they talk about in this movie. You become an adult. You, you try to function. You try to be, you know, one of society. You get an aneurysm. You get your memories wiped out. You rebuild yourself. It's a lot to go through in one life. <laughs> and then seeing this fictional story about the Joker of all things, a character I'm not even that crazy. I don't like the Joker that much. He's not really an interesting character to me. But watching this movie, seeing that scene, it broke me. And I started crying and my roommate knew and he was like, are you, are you okay? And I'm like, um, yeah, 
I'm, we're fine. We're going to be all right. I'll make it through. It's just a movie. We get through the movie. At the end, you find out Arthur was put through all this horrible stuff as a kid. And that abused side is what's you're needing to get out. It's the side that doesn't want to be a part of society because society destroyed him. Took away his innocence, took away his youth, took away his life, took away his happiness, took away his ability to be happy. Um, it ruined him. And, uh, you know, you, you can't help but think, like, how hard it must be to battle that. So when I was watching this movie, I was like, the performances were so good. And Joaquin was so good. He breaks down. He starts crying in that, in that you know, stairwell there. And after that, he just snaps. He stops taking his medicine. The guy from work comes. He stabs him in the neck. He apparently lets the other guy go away. Who knows if that's true? We never see that guy again later in the movie. I'm guessing he did. He might have ran and got the cops because that's what explain how the cops show up in the next scene. Zazzy beats. God, I don't even want to think about what might have happened there because we never see her again at the, after the end or her daughter. We don't see them at the end watching the news or anything. So I can only imagine what happened in that scene. It's brutal. And I know there was stuff cut from this movie because if you go back to our first videos, there was like him talking to the other clown out in the street and they're like arguing about something. And that was filmed. And we we, we looked at that footage. Uh, Todd Phillips put it out there and his his team put it out there. And uh, we, we talked about it on one of my episodes of Amusement Mile. And uh, it was one of the first ones, I think. And that scene was not in the movie. So I'm sure the DVD, I'm like, I've got to buy this movie. Because like I said, that, that scene challenged me. It, it made me look at myself and go, shit. <laughs> like... Like, how many bad things can happen to one person and you, you endure it and you, you know, are you a good person at the end of the day? Are you part of society? Does society really want you? Um, do you feel connected to people or are you just going through the motions because you don't know what else to do because you mimic people for so long. You've been watching them and how they act like some kind of alien from another planet. And you're like, yeah, I guess that's how people act. So I, I'll just treat people that way and I'll try to be nice or, you know, whatever. And it is this movie did that to me. And I know some people are like, dude, it's just a movie. It's whatever. It's like, yeah, sure. But when you actually go through similar things as a character goes through in a movie, um, yeah, it, it caused a different reaction out of you. It, it challenges you, makes you ask questions about everything. And I, I don't identify with Arthur. You know, it's not like, I, I mean, I don't see myself in the character just because, you know, there's been similar things, you know, not the same thing, obviously, but I don't connect with the character on that level. I just, as a, as someone who's fought you know, so hard to, to, uh, you know, to still be here and, uh, to get through all the bullshit, um, of life. And it's like, I, I see, I, I, I was just hoping he wouldn't hurt anyone else. That's what I was rooting for. I, I was comparing this movie to, it's almost like you have a friend that you know, maybe is, or maybe they're not a friend, maybe they're just someone who's in your life somehow. And you, and you suspect maybe if anyone's going to do anything horrible, it's probably going to be them. And, you, and you're helpless to stop it. Um, that's what it was like watching this movie. It was like, it's like you feel, because every scene's Arthur. So you you feel like you know him in a way. And you, I don't know, I just, I, I kept, I was like, stop, Arthur. Stop doing this. You know, like, don't become the Joker. Don't do this. But then every time he reached out with a hand to somebody, he kept reaching to the wrong people because they kept slapping it away. They kept judging him and you know and putting him in a, a box you know that he didn't want to be in and then awakening the darker side of him i mean that the only person who tried to do the right thing was the guy at arkham who didn't want to give him the file he, he just didn't he's like i can't let this guy know the truth he doesn't know look at him he doesn't know and uh so when arthur gets hit with that so from the one person who tried to do the right thing and arthur took that opportunity away from the guy i mean this movie structurally cinematography acting Everything in it is so well done. Everything's on purpose. Um, I liked it. I'm not going to call this movie a masterpiece, but it really sucked me in um, to the point where it's a great film. I really think it's a great film. Um, there's some there's some things I could probably nitpick, but overall, I mean, I don't even want to. It's it, it it pulled me in that much, and like I said, I didn't connect with Arthur, but at the end, all I wanted him, I was just like, just if you're going to do some horrific, just you know, you've killed the guy down, you know, the the other clown killed your mother at this point when you find out the truth he goes in and suffocates his mother and then he i don't know what he does is as he beats I'm, I'm gonna assume the worst there at the end you're just like just go on the show like you originally planned blow your own brains out he was gonna do a, a joke knock knock who's there boom 
That was going to be his punchline. He was going to kill himself on live TV on Robert De Niro's show at the end. And because Robert De Niro pushes him and starts judging him, and people in the audience are judging him, and then he confesses that he killed the three kids on the subway train. And I, I've, I've, I've interrupted myself earlier. The three boys on the subway train earlier, they were taunting a woman. Someone was saying that the taxi car that drives by when he's hanging with Zazzy Beats, even though she's not really there, um, when the taxi car, uh, car drives by, there's a clown in the backseat that's looking at Arthur and they make an eye, they make eye contact. Someone said that that was, she, they were dressed the same way and had the same long hair as the girl on the train. So you're basically seeing that this girl on the train that was almost, you know, sexually assaulted or whatever those guys wanted to do to her, um, you know, we don't really know what their intentions were. And we also saw it from Arthur's perspective. So, I mean, but I would say that most likely happened to that extent. Uh, so, cause that's what Arthur was saying. He's like, you guys are willing to defend these three boys who were going to do something bad and I killed them and I don't feel bad about it anymore. He's like, I'm not on my meds anymore. The real me, I'm tired of suppressing how I'm, how I want to feel. And that was the thing. That's when you realized he's a lost cause. And that's the moment when he turns and says, you know what? I'm not going to take my own life. He says, tell, I'm going to tell you a joke. He's like, knock, knock, who's there? And he goes, Murray, you know, you could have done better or whatever. And he pulls out the gun and he shoots Murray instead of himself. That scene was so tense sitting there with him in the, in the, in the room and, he comes out as Joker. He's finally, he's like dancing. So he lets the dance. That was the sign. That was the Joker sign. Like after he kills the three boys in the subway, um, he's back in the bathroom and he dances. And that's like, that's the Joker. It's like, that's the side of him that is like, all right, I'm ready to come out and play again. So at the end, when he dances, before he goes on the show, I'm like, oh no, like, oh no. So I'm sitting there tense. And even he's sitting there tapping his leg. And I'm like, what's happening? What's happening? And there's like the Arthur and Joker side are going back and forth, back and forth. And then finally, the Joker side wins and it kills, he kills Murray. And it's, it's shocking because it feels very real. Um, and because, you know, we see so much violence in movies, guns being fired, you know, molten, you know, machine guns, rocket launchers, and we all kind of ingest it as, you know, it's like, yeah, it's movie violence, whatever. But they did this so realistically. It's, it's just one boom. And then he gets up and shoots him two more times, almost like Jack Nichol, like a, like a nod to Jack Nicholson's Joker, uh, only less, uh, you know, cartoony. It was, it's very intense. And that was the thing, this movie, this movie's tone is consistent. It's very consistent. Um, it's very grounded. It's, uh, and it's, it's a hard pill to swallow, man. I think that's why I reson it resonated with me. I'm not going to, you know, I didn't say, like I said, I'm not connecting with Arthur. I didn't simp I didn't really sympathize too much. I, there was maybe some empathy there, but there was a rooting. There was a root. I kept rooting. Like if you're gonna do something bad, take your own life. Don't, don't spread your evil. And that's what he does at the end, though. He chooses to be. He has to be Joker, right? And that's the freaking tragedy of this. Was that you know, I? I knew I was wishing for something that wasn't gonna happen, and that's why it was harder for me at the end when he reveals everyone who what he did, and then everyone. So then he kills Murray, and then the audience clears out. They arrest him, and as he's being you know driven around town. Gotham has lost it, you know, uh, the, the disenfranchised and, and the people who are probably also just one push away from crazy um, or are crazy or, you know, and I hate to use that term, obviously, but have like mental issues and stuff. Um, he he found his audience and uh, and they uh, they reacted in kind and they propped him up as, you know, someone who set a path for them and it changed Gotham, right? Because Gotham was falling apart. They talk about the garbage strike, garbage, there's garbage piling up everywhere. I mean, you feel when you're watching this movie, one, it's very New York, uh, very late seventies, early eighties, New York. My roommate kept telling me he's from that, you know, he lived in New York in that era too. And he just kept talking about all these things. Oh, that was so, you know, I, I've been down to 43rd street or whatever. And he's talking about all this stuff and he got a lot more out of this movie regarding that kind of stuff, obviously than I did, but I, it was still cool to hear him talk about it and, and see how much attention was paid to not just the movie but the era the clothing the type of suits were very retro that that thomas wayne was wearing and things like that and it was just like it was and even the clothes arthur was wearing it's it's everything was very intentional and on purpose and very well crafted and it was interesting to see that with a joker movie because um you know I'm not a big fan of the character. He's not. He's not even in my top ten favorite Batman villains. I like. A, I like Mister Freeze and Two Face and Clayface and uh, Poison Ivy. There's so many other characters I like over Joker. Uh, so maybe that's also why I got a different reaction out of this because I'm like I'm not a big fan of the character. But this, I was like I, I hate that I understand this guy because it it's tough. 
Um, and I think that's okay. Like people are like, oh, that means you like him and you want to be like him. It's like, no, it doesn't. I don't want to be anything like Arthur Fleck. Um, I don't want anyone to be like Arthur Fleck. I don't want anyone to hurt the way he had to hurt when he was a kid or as an adult and suffer and be, you know, take meds to, you know, I don't want anyone like that. That's a, that's horrible. It's horrible. Um, so watching someone like that challenged me. And that's, I think, the beauty of this movie is that I didn't walk out really feeling good about anything, but I felt that I went through something. And I haven't felt like that watching a movie in a long time. Um, seriously. Like, I mean, there have been movies for sure that, that impacted me in certain ways. But walking out of this one, I was like, I don't know how to feel. I feel like I've been just my soul has been punched repeatedly. And I feel like I let someone down. <laughs> Like, I feel like uh, he couldn't hear me rooting for him to stop, you know, doing evil things. And, um, yeah, man, I don't know. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's not healthy to, to get that invested. But that's how I felt. And then his evil spread so much that, you know, big spoilers here. Like, you know, he didn't pull the trigger and kill the Waynes like they did in the Tim Burton movie. But maybe Joe Chill did. There was a guy in a mask who walked up to the Waynes in an alley and shot them um, as they came out of the Azoro movie. Just like in the comics. Um, I wish it was Grey Ghost, but, you know, whatever. It's cool. It's Zoro's cool. That's obviously the comics and stuff. Um, but uh, seeing this and seeing that happen and see that the evil that spread, um, you know, from that was, you know, that Joker caused led to crime just reaching this zenith. And that is what got the Waynes killed. And that is why Gotham... And that probably lingers for the next 20 years, you know, those people acting that way, probably not fully because I'm sure a lot of them were arrested and, and that probably that incident probably died down eventually. Um, but Joker's still out there. He's in, you know, in a mental health facility now. And that scene at the end where he's like, I'm just thinking of a joke and he has a flash of Bruce's, um, you know, family, you know, that could mean two things. It could mean that, you know, he knows that Thomas Wayne died based on, you know, him killing Murray on the show and it led to this big riot and that led to Thomas Wayne's death. So he could be thinking that, or for all we know, that scene takes place, you know, 10 or 12 years later, because they don't really say how long, you know, it's past, time's passed. And he could know that Bruce is Batman now, you know, and, and he's like, you know, I'm, I'm reaching here, obviously, but, you know, he's like, I'm thinking of a joke. And he's probably thinking, oh, I, I created the Batman. Um, or he could just be like, or I, I did something that led to Thomas Wayne dying, and I'm okay with that, too, because turns out he wasn't my dad, but he was, you know. Uh, high up on the food chain, he called us all clowns, you know, and on, on TV and, and, and rep helped repress us. And he was going to become mayor and repress us further. Who knows? I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways you can take this. And that's what I like about it. Because one of my favorite lines in the Killing Joke comic book, I hate the cartoon movie, for sure. I hate that movie so much. But the comic book was really good. And the comic book had this line where he says, you know, if I'm gonna have an origin, I prefer it to be multiple choice. So there's just enough at the end there where you're like, there's some options here. Um, did any of it happened? I think it did. I think a lot of it happened. Um, I don't think it was a Dallas kind of ending where all of it was in his head. I think it, you know, I think it really was. Because there was that moment at the beginning where he flashes, like, why were you in a mental health, health facility? And it shows him sm mashing his head. You could easily say he's been there the whole time. And all that stuff, he th you know, happens in a movie is, is like flashbacks or it's not real or whatever. But I don't know. I, I choose, I, ch I like the fact that it could be any of them or all of them together. And it works because it's, that's how I've known Joker is the in, the few times I found him interesting were versions like this where it's like we didn't get an origin. This is definitely the first time we've got a real origin for Joker. And that's scary, too, because this is a character has been around 80 years. Um, next year, I think, is his 80th birthday in the comics. And uh, and he's had no origin. Like, how crazy is that? He's had no origin. The closest we've gotten to was Killing Joke, and that's even, like, wasn't originally intended to be continuity. And then even so, there's those lines about multiple choice. So was it really an origin? So there's just, I mean, I could, I, as you can see, I'm talking about this movie forever. I mean, I have a lot to say about it, but I also, like, I, that's great to me because I'm, I, I knew this was going to be something interesting from the get-go because I'm like, they're doing Joker, no Batman, and it's got a great actor in it. And that's how I thought about Venom. But Venom was like this weird, wacky, you know, late 90s, early 2000s throwback comic book film that, you know, just had Tom Hardy con uh, committing to the role, but in like a very zany kind of frantic way. And this was like this very quiet, reserved until it exploded, you know. Um, 
and it was intense and and the movie really left an impact on me and i was like wow i did not ex uh, even the trailers as good as they were i just didn't expect this level um you know coming out of it i didn't expect to, to have this much to say about a joker movie but i do and uh, i know a lot of you out there may agree or disagree so if that's the case that's fine let me know down below what you think uh, of this film have you seen it yourself i hope so please god i hope you didn't watch me talk about the whole movie before you go see it but if you did I don't know. Hopefully it gets you to go see it. I mean, you know, I'm not here to help sell tickets to the movie. I'm just here to give you my opinion. But, you know, I would say give it a shot. I mean, now that you've seen my or hear my perspective of it, you understand why I enjoyed the movie. But it's hard to even say that. Do I like this movie? Do I love this movie? Did I enjoy this movie? It's hard because it's such a it's like you don't it it it, it challenges you. You, it's like it's it's like Black Hawk Down. Like I don't, I, it's hard for me to say that's a good movie because I remember the, some of those events. So it's hard for me to go, yeah, that's a good movie. Uh, I just go, it's a well-made movie because uh, obviously a lot of those things really happened and it was intense and lives were lost and it, yeah, it was a it was it's a it's a really intense situation that they were in um, during that time period. So it was like this is not real. This is not a real character, but it is reflective of people out there who might feel lost someone who would feel like they could go and cause a lot of harm um and that would you know ease some kind of pain that they're in uh it's tough knowing that there are people out there like that and we should only want to try to help you know and man that's why i found myself in this movie was i was trying from the audience to help arthur you know not make the wrong decisions and uh, i failed him in that movie watching it and uh, and i think that's you know, what maybe Todd Phillips was going for on some level. He was probably looking at this going, I just want people to not know how they should feel at the end of this movie. I want people to just see the performance and see the cinematography and, and like it on a technical level, which I do on a technical level and on an acting level and a score and music and sound. And, I mean, this movie just rocks on all of those levels. But the, the, the subject matter is the hard pill to swallow. You got to swallow it, right? You got to stay on your meds, right, Arthur? So you guys let me know. What do you think down below in the comment section? If you uh, have any you know, notes you want to give me on this review or this discussion, let me know too. We'll continue our conversation down there and we'll do full spoilers. But I pretty much talked about everything, but I'd still love to hear your thoughts as well. So let them be known down in the comments so I can hear your thoughts on this movie. And maybe at some point I can read some of those comments and respond to them. Um, and we can make a separate video, like a, a final amusement mile video. Or, you know, if you're watching this on my main channel, this will be a Seek and Destroy episode. Um, but I'll, you know, maybe we'll do that and we'll put it here as well as another Seek and Destroy episode. So, you know, comment as much as you want down below. And maybe I'll do a video where I read those and respond to them. Um, so that way you guys are part of this discussion as well. Uh, because it's a, a intense movie and on some levels, an important one. Um, if you want it to be, if you want to, you know, if you choose to... Uh, view it that way and I kind of do I think uh, on a technical level I learned a lot about certain camera angles and, and camera tricks in this that I thought were really great and, and subtle ways to move the camera um, I've been trying to get an eye for visual stuff more and more so I can hopefully make my videos more interesting when I go out and shoot vlogs and stuff like I, I did at LA Comic Con this weekend so I you know and I've had good feedback on that one so far about the style it's different than some of my other vlogs not as long it's more to the point um so you know I, I'm trying to learn I'm a student uh, myself in storytelling so um yeah it's a, it's affected me and this movie it, it did its job as, as far as I'm concerned as far as uh you know being a, a solid film uh, and I hope, you know, he gets at least a nomination for it. That'd be crazy if this, you know, there's a lot to this character, I guess. Like two actors now. Uh, one of them, Heath Ledger, already won, you know, best actor for this, uh, playing this character. And now maybe Joaquin Phoenix, I hope he does too, because uh, it's this is a commitment, this performance. And I, I hope his agent after this movie was like, your next three movies, you're doing voices for cartoon movies. Uh, you know, like you cannot, no more dramas, nothing for a while. We need to get you back in a positive mindset. And you're going to do the voices for like a hamster in a movie. And you're going to play the voice of like a piece of like, uh, like a banana or something. Like, uh, you know, I, I hope his agent is like, we need to clear your mind a little bit. Because a role like this, I can't imagine committing to this, playing this character and then bouncing back. And then these journalists have, the, like they, they, they have them in for an interview and they ask them these asinine questions and they bring up the, the the controversy that they're trying to stir up so they can get clicks and stuff and it's like this guy gave this performance and 
he's trying to come back from it. You know how committed you have to be to a character to do this and then come back and be a normal functioning human being. He's like a vegan in real life too. Like he's like, he, he sounds like a good person. <laughs> so it's, I can't imagine this was easy for him and to bounce back. I mean, just the disrespect some of these journalists have when they get to interview someone like Joaquin is like uh, after this performance or Todd Phillips, and they take all these sound bites and they twist their words or they or they they say their words, but they, you know like you know in the moment like Todd Phillips gets heated and he's like yeah shh, stop talking about my movie talk about John Wick you know whatever it's like you can't really compare a lot of movies to each other this one does stand on its own they shouldn't compare this movie to anything if you don't want to go see this movie don't go see it but if you do just know that it might challenge you and if you're okay with that I think you might actually enjoy the movie on some level um or maybe love it who knows you know you're up it's up to you what you decide but for me i thought it was a great film it's hard to love it obviously because of the subject matter um it's hard to say that i love it but it is a great film and i'm definitely going to buy it the day it comes out and watch all the bonus features probably watch the commentary track i hope they do one with joaquin and todd phillips i'd love to hear that and I'd love to see anything that was cut from the movie and why, because uh, this was very well crafted and they delivered a great film. And I think you should go see it. But that's just my opinion. If you disagree or agree, let me know down below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. Um, I've talked well enough about this movie, probably like 55, 60 minutes now, uh, but I felt like it deserved it. You know, we talked a lot about Venom and we did a whole show on Venom since I did kind of on my other channel, on the Batman channel. Um, I have all my Amusement Miles episodes over there if you're watching this on me because I'm recording this, but I'm going to use it for both shows, obviously. Um, so the intros are different, but the rest of this is all the same. Obviously, I'm not going to edit anything out uh, because I want these in both places because uh, I'm trying to grow that channel, but I also don't want you guys to have to go subscribe to that channel to hear this discussion because I think we've started joker stuff on this channel before and i kind of wanted to put an end to it so we'll do this and if you have some good comments i'll read them in another video and we'll continue the conversation for one more episode uh, before we say goodbye to amusement mile on this channel but maybe we'll still do joker stuff on the batman channel from time to time because i'd like to explore this character more and i know when three jokers comes out my comic review will definitely be over on the batman channel so make sure you're subscribed to that i'll put a link to it down below i just started it so it's not a lot of content on there right now but i'm working on it for sure Thank you so much for watching the show. As always, I really do appreciate it. Um, and we already talked about comments. Leave them down below and we'll get to them in a future video for sure. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.